Uh, my name is Brandon Pitts. I am the newest assistant professor here, uh, hired last January, so January 2017. Um, and these are some pictures of my lab, which we're gonna be updating because the lab has grown since. Uh, and so we'll be updating these pictures and you'll get to see some of the tools and things we have in our, our research lab. So, um, but I am an assistant professor and also a faculty associate in the uh, Center for Aging and the Life course here at Purdue. Um, just a little bit about me. I'm originally from uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So some people may recognize a Southern accent. Um, I did my undergrad at Louisiana State University and then left there, uh, went directly to the University of Michigan where I did both a master's and a PhD, and then about a four month postdoc just before coming here. So that's a little bit about my background. If anyone is more interested, we can talk later on. Um, if you look at the IE website, you'll see these, this is where they have me listed under. So uh, mainly in human factors. And I am on, I think Professor Denny Yu talked to you guys about human factors. He might have distinguished between the physical and the cognitive. I work more in the cognitive side of things. So what we're looking at is how do you design information? How do you design displays? How do you design uh, interfaces that are in line with how people process information? So attention management, uh, memory, um, those kind of things, right? So if you look at it, cognitive ergonomics, uh, very interested in human automation interaction. You'll hear in just a second from Professor Wax, who's doing some things with human robot interaction. They go hand in hand. We're talking about systems that are operating by themselves, but for which humans are interacting with. Um, multimodal display design, that's where most of my dissertation work was. That deals with presenting information to people in a number of different sensory channels or sensory modalities. So vision, hearing, and touch. Um, adaptive display design has to do with um, com designing interfaces that are intelligent enough to respond to how people are performing. Okay, so if the system knows that a person is overwhelmed, then it might adjust information content. If it knows that I'm bored, then it might increase information content, something like that. Um, and then the one that's probably closest to my heart is the one that deals with aging and technology, which people in this field now call gerund technology. So that is interested in both how do you design, well, how do you understand um, how people, how older adults interact with technology, and then how do you design displays, information, interfaces that support older adults, okay? But it's all still dealing with cognitive aspects of things. Um, so the name of my lab is called the Enhanced Lab, um, and it stands for the Next Generation Human Systems and Cognitive Ergonomics, or sorry, Cognitive Engineering. Um, the Next Generation deals with both the next suite of technologies that are coming, but it also deals with the next group of people that we ought to be thinking about designing for. So it kind of works there. Um, but the overall goal of our lab is really to, through the improvement of interface design, is to really enhance the performance of operators in a wide range of environments. Um, and we're talking about those that are generally demanding. So uh, in driving, in aviation, in medicine, space operation, military, so on and so forth. Um, and because I said aging is dear to my heart, most of our experiments, most of the things we're interested in are focused on older adult populations. Um, so we're talking about environments, driving, um, space, medicine, so on and so forth, that are complex and that are characterized by these uh, different factors. So some of them are that their information or the environment itself is dynamic, it's fast moving, uh, it's high tempo, it's uh, event driven, there's a lot going on. Uh, there's a chance for a person to be confused. There's a chance for a person to be overloaded, so on and so forth. Um, high risk, so when we talk about aviation and space, um, things that have severe consequences if they go wrong, called is number one, how do you define what old is, right? So I said right now, people are generally using this standard 65 and older, but some people say, well, is it 60 and older? Is it 70 and older? Is it 75? We, we really don't know. And if you look at a lot of research studies in human factors, you see that people are varying age in a number of ways. So that's one thing that makes it tricky. But the other thing that makes it tricky is that age is not uh, homogeneous across people or homogeneous, however you want to say it. Um, what that means is that chronological age, me thinking about just how old someone is in terms of a number doesn't tell me about a person's physical or mental capabilities. 
So someone who's 75 years old might outperform someone who's 60 based on a lot of other factors. And so that's what really makes aging complicated, which is why we want to go towards an adaptive uh, way of looking at systems so that it is tailored to individual needs. Um, but here are some things that if you are older and you have perceptual cognitive challenges, some things that you may um, suffer from or you may experience is delayed response time to critical events. So put this in terms of any of those complex environments that I talked about. Um, misinformation, missed signals altogether. Um, increased confusion. So if a machine is so complex that you can't understand what's going on, you may um, draw the wrong conclusion about how to respond to it. And then the one that throws people off a lot, and I never really thought about this until I got into this line of work, um, is this idea of trust and mistrust. So what that means is either you trust the technology more than you should, or you trust it less than you should. And both of those are dangerous situations, right? So if I think that a machine is more capable than it is, then I may not monitor it, I may not intervene. There are things that I may not do, trust it to do what, it, what I think it should do, and then it doesn't do it, I'm in trouble. But then the other way around, if a machine is more capable than I think it is, and I try to intervene, and I have some limitations, I don't understand things correctly, I'm missing signals, then I could cause some injury or some harm, right? So both of those cases are bad, and we think about, uh, we call that trust calibration. How do we get people's trust in line with the capability of technology? Um, all right, this is one study I did in graduate school. Um, the idea here was that we put people in a driving simulator, and we had them drive down a highway. We presented to them seven different signals. Whenever you see V, that stands for visual. Whenever you see A, that stands for auditory. Whenever you see T, that stands for tactile. And then, so we had each combination, and then we had one pair where you give them all three signals at once. And what we were trying to figure out is how well can both younger and older adults detect these signals in the presence of, well, while they're driving. So basically, how accurate were they in telling us that they noticed either a light, a sound, or a vibration, both or all three, okay? And what you can see is that this first bar of the younger adults, not, not surprising, right? Uh, when it gets to the combination, they weren't at 100%, but they still were the highest in terms of uh, the, the group. So we had three groups, a younger adult group, an older retired, and an older working. They both were over 65. Um, but what you can see is that, for the most part, things are okay with singles. But when you start getting to doubles and triples, this is when things start falling off, okay? Um, so people are missing things, right? That's what this means. And these signals related to two different events. So, for example, the visual signal might have been a, a something on the navigation system. The auditory signal could have been collision warning. The uh, vibration might have been lane departure warning, right? And so you give, all, you give them all three signals at once and see what they can detect, what they can respond to. Any guesses about what might have happened when you give them all three? Why do you think, what do you think people were messing up the most on? So you see this percentage is like 80 something, 88%. Is it 88? Yeah, about 88 percent. What do you think the older retired people were? Uh, what do you? Where do you think their mistake was? Well, uh, which one? Why? Why do you say that? Okay, so he's saying he feels like they were missing the visual signal out of all three. Oh, they were focusing on the visual. Okay, so but what do you? So what does that mean? If they were focusing on visual, what what were they doing wrong then? All right. Very good. Yep. Okay. So any other guesses? Tactile, right? Why do you say that? Based on the graphs, you can see that the visual and the audio, the graphs are right. But when the tactile comes into play, the graphs are dropping. Okay. So that's exactly what happened. So maybe I'm too far. So what we found was that for both older adult groups, when you give them a light, a sound, and a vibration, the vibration was the one that they tended not to notice. Okay? Um, and this was after we had them adjust the intensity of each signal so to where intensity should have been 
a factor, right? So you couldn't say, well, the vibration was weaker than the light and the sound. That wasn't necessarily the case. Why do you think they might have been missing T? All right, I'll let you think about that. So um, then the other case, so in this case, when you give them a sound and a vibration, what do you think they were doing here? I give them just a sound and a vibration, but there wasn't a 100% hit rate, meaning that they didn't say that it was sound and vibration. They said something else. What was that something else? All right. Believe it or not, they falsely reported that a light was there. So you give them a sound, you give them a vibration, and they say that was a sound, a light, and a vibration. And this was the finding that startled us the most. Okay? We looked around in the literature. This is a phenomenon. Some people talk about this idea of visual persistence, where you've had a light before, you've had some kind of visual signal before, and based on the time that the next signal was presented, you still think that one is, is uh, present. We don't know that that was the case. That's one possible explanation. But like I said, with the overtrust and the undertrust, missing a T or adding a V, both of those are dangerous in the context of driving. Because if I, if I miss a signal and you're warning me about something, I'm in trouble. But if you, give, if you give me two signals, but I think a third one is there and I respond, then I'm in trouble. So I'm just trying to show you why this kind of work is important. All right, um, just to wrap up here. So I would really like to think of myself in three areas. One of them is context sensitive display design. Uh, one of them is autonomous systems. And the third one deals with technology acceptance, use, and trust. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but we have had projects, so multimodal, you've seen some examples of that. Adaptive, I told you that those are systems that are intelligent enough to respond to uh, a person's either performance in an environment or their physiological performance. So if a system is measuring a heart rate, then I should be able to adjust my information based on this person's heart rate is too high. Let me limit the amount of information I give them until it slows down, those kind of things. Um, we've had a project this past year that was funded by the Federal Aviation Administration where we were trying to um, see what was the feasibility of adding speech recognition displays to general aviation cockpits. Um, some of that work is actually still going on. So that's one category for me, kind of this multimodal context sensitive display design. Um, another one is this idea of autonomous systems, primarily driving. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, also, autonomous transparency. So that means as systems become more complex, how can we communicate to humans what's going on in case something breaks down, in case they need to intervene, OK? Um, this idea of dyna dynamic function allocation and transfer of control has to do with um, what does the machine do? What does the human do? And how do you communicate to one another about their roles? In an autonomous vehicle, if I'm driving uh, and my cruise control is on, my adaptive cruise control, and my lane keep assist is on, the vehicle struggles to detect something and throws the control back to me, how can, you, how can I inform the person in enough time to where they can effectively take over and achieve what we call a smooth transition of control, okay? That's some work we have that's funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, if you're ever interested, we're over in MGL, which is just on the other side of Grissom. Uh, we're in 1311, and this is a picture of the uh, driving sim that we have. Um, I'm running out of time. And then the last one here, like I say, is about uh, technology trust, acceptance, and use. So understanding, particularly for older adults, um, how do I establish trust in technology? Does that make me accept it? And then if I accept it, do I ultimately use it? How do I use it? How can I quantify interactions between machines and the older adult human? Um, that is all I have. If you have any questions, I am in 288 upstairs.